morning again, everyone. If you would, open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3. We are in the middle of a digression by the author of Ephesians, Paul. He started a prayer for his readers at the beginning of chapter 3, and then he interrupted himself and began the digression to talk about the, the the gospel ministry. He wanted to make sure they understood the scope and the purpose of God in the gospel going forward in the world. So that's the digression we're, we're about to conclude this morning. But I'd like to read this whole section just for the context. We're going to look at verses 10 through 13 in particular this morning. But let's read the whole passage as, as Paul outlines the scope and the purpose of the mission of the gospel. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason I, Paul... A prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So, I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Root.com alerted me to a article written by New York Times writer David Brooks. I don't recommend all this writing. This is just a particular article that he wrote. And in this summary, the following was written. New York Times writer David Brooks recently lamented on the annual ritual of American colleges sending off another class of graduates into the world that hardly sets them up for success with a gloomy job market, anemic prospects for growth, and a dark thundercloud of suffocating federal debt. But given the challenging economic outlook, there is an even more insidious send-off that does little to help set graduates up for future success. This includes the continuous stream of graduation speeches that encourage graduates to follow your dreams, polish your strengths, embrace your passions, march to the beat of your own drum, and remember you're behind the wheel in driving the success of your career. The title of Brooks' column was, It's Not About You. Brooks suggests that the purpose of life is not to find yourself, but to lose it. 
He warns that the mantra of expressive individualism misleads on nearly every front. It most certainly can give way to three big distractions in a young person's journey to success. The root of the big distractions is a focus on me rather than we, includes building your resume as well as an unhealthy preoccupation with WIIFM, what's in it for me. What this seemingly innocent focus on self seems to overlook is the fact that most people, most people, that are truly engaged, leaders that are consistently effective, and companies that are the role models of success, spend most of their time focused on things bigger than themselves. I think that is Paul's heart in this passage. His discernment alerted him to a need in the Ephesians that interrupted a very meaningful prayer that he's going to pray next week. A very meaningful prayer. But he discerned as he thought about them and as he's writing this letter the possibility that they might need a, a broader, a grander description of what God is doing, that they would be drawn away from this idea that the gospel even is primarily or even exclusively about them, that after his chronicle of the benefits of the gospel, that they might gradually begin to think of it in individual terms, and that he wants their lives to be effective, faithful in the kingdom of God, and so he's pointing them to something else. And he says, in effect, it's not about... You, you need to spend most of your time focusing on something bigger than yourself. I think if I could summarize verses 10 through 13, where Paul gives the purpose, the goal of his digression in describing the gospel ministry. Why is this gospel ministry present in the world? Why is it present? And what impact should this purpose have on the church? I think he would say this, don't lose sight of the glorious purpose of the gospel mission. Keep the glorious goal of the gospel mission in view. Keep your eyes on something much bigger than yourself. You and I, Paul says, are not the point. But, but, together, we are a part of a point God is making about himself. You and I, Paul would say, are not the point. But together we are a part of a point God is making about himself. I want to summarize this passage with two points. First, don't lose sight of the goal. Don't lose sight of the goal. Look down there, if you would, at verse 10. Remember, Paul has been describing his gospel ministry and how the gospel came to him, and there was this revelation about the Gentiles being included in the church. That's the accent here as he's talking about not just salvation in general, but the particular mystery that people from all nations are going to be made into a new body uh, in Christ, a new church on the earth, that that is God's mystery that he has now revealed through Paul's preaching, that the gospel would create this, this new humanity of every tribe and tongue made one in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you get to this very important word in verse 10. Look down in your Bible's very important word. Anytime you have words like this in the Bible, you need to key in on them because they reveal something that's crucial in the, in the logical progression of the passage. Verse 10, so that all that he's been describing, the proclamation of the mystery, the revelation of the mystery, Gentiles and Jews made one in Christ. Why was all this revealed? What is the purpose? What is the goal, Paul would say? Don't lose sight of the goal in verse 10. So that, what is the point of all of this gospel mission? What is the goal? What is the big thing bigger than ourselves? It is this. So that through the church, the manifold, that means many splendored wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. What's the big thing 
that Paul wants them to see. What's the big goal? The big goal of the gospel mission, the ultimate goal, the primary goal, is not the saving of individuals, but the display of God's glory to the heavenly realm. The big goal, the ultimate goal, the big thing bigger than us, is not us, but the display of God's glory specifically to the rulers, he says, the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. That is the goal. Paul says, don't lose sight of the goal. Keep the goal of the gospel mission in view. Now, there's a demonstration going on. All of this gospel preaching that leads to the creation of gospel communities is declaring something. It's demonstrating something. And Paul says it's demonstrating God's wisdom, and that demonstration is for a particular audience. We're not even primarily the audience of this demonstration. Paul is demonstrating his wisdom through the preaching of the gospel that creates gospel communities of saved people from every race and, and, and nation, and he's demonstrating this for the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now, commentators don't all agree. Are, are those primarily evil, like demonic rulers and authorities? Are those good, as in angels, rulers and authorities? I, I tend to think Paul is intentionally vague. He, he's speaking of rulers and authorities, some of which are evil and some of which are good. The heavenly places here, it doesn't. it's not speaking of heaven as we would think of heaven. It's describing the spiritual realm. Paul is saying there's a realm that we don't see. It's actually a major theme in Ephesians. We get to chapter 6. It's going to talk all about spiritual warfare and the armor of God that we have in the gospel. So it's a theme that, that God is doing something that is not seen by human eyes, but is the, the theater before which the gospel progress is on display. And he says there's, there's rulers and authorities in the what we might call the angelic realm. And they're watching. They are watching God. They're watching what God is doing. They are observing. And God had a wisdom, a, a glorious plan that they were not able to see through the ages. They watched Abraham, they watched Isaac, they watched God part the Red Sea, they watched God pass over, so they thought, former sins, and perhaps it surprised them. I thought God was holy. How is this a part of his plan? Why isn't this sinful humanity being punished fully for their sin? Will God only rescue one nation on earth? Will that be the only place of his salvation? There was a, a hidden wisdom that they did not see. And then God begins to proclaim through the mouth of Paul and other gospel preachers the plan of salvation that includes people from every tribe and nation and that gospel pro proclamation does its work and, and gospel communities spring up around the known world where Jews and Gentiles formerly at enmity with one another are now one in Christ Jesus. And it's this, this tangible demonstration. It is God's wisdom made visible on the earth. And the angelic world is watching. Look at this, says God. Watch this. There's a wisdom you haven't seen till now. But you look down there at the Ephesian church, Jew and Gentile, in Christ, bold before God, worshiping together in union with Christ, saved from their sin. What kind of wisdom could bring that about? Behold the wisdom of the Lord. What's the big goal? What's the goal of the gospel mission? That God's glorious wisdom would be put on display, would be showcased, would be revealed. 
Don't lose sight of the goal, Paul says. It is, it's possible, as we sing and celebrate the benefit of the gospel to us, that we lose sight of the ultimate display in the gospel and through its tangible evidence in gospel communities of God's glory, specifically God's wisdom, to the angelic world. We don't think about angels and demons in this country very much. I think other countries think about them a lot more than we do. But God thinks about them. They're these non-human beings who are watching God. They're watching God. They're, you might say, taking their cue from God. What is God going to do? Some of them hate him, some of them love him. And they're watching to see what, what's going to happen. And Paul says God is displaying true wisdom through the creation of gospel communities that are birthed through the preaching of the gospel. Don't lose sight of the goal, Paul says. You need something bigger than yourself. And there is something bigger. No less than a public, cosmic demonstration of divine wisdom through the establishment of worshiping communities of every tribe and nation. Don't lose sight of the goal. Charles Spurgeon says this, The church is not formed to be a social club, to produce society for itself, not to be a political association, to be a power in politics, not even to be a religious confederacy promoting its own opinions. It is a body created by the Lord to answer his own ends and purposes. Now we need to see the goal. We also need to see the instrument of this goal. Look down there again at verse 10. It says, so that, notice the instrument. The goal is the manifold wisdom of God displayed. The audience is the rulers and authorities. But notice this instrumentation. So that through the church, through the church, notice the instrument of this goal. I, I find that sometimes we are... Uh, passionate about the glory of God, but we don't like the instrument God has chosen to use. Other times, there are seasons in the life of the church where we're more passionate about the instrument than we are about the goal. This verse helps us greatly. It, it doesn't say, so that the church would be the most glorious thing in the universe. So if there was a church, or if there was any season in our church, where our church became the goal rather than the means to a goal, we would need to return to Ephesians to remember. Now, the, the church is just the instrument. It's the, it's the science experiment that reveals something. It's not the goal. It's not the end. But it is the means to an end. The, the other danger is that we'd be passionate about the glory of God but dismiss God's chosen instrument. Many young people, I find, fall into this trap. They love the glory of God. They don't like the church. And it's understandable because churches are imperfect. Leaders are imperfect. They sin. They fail. Pastors that preach one thing don't always live to that same thing. And it's disillusioning and disheartening and discouraging. So it's understandable why people would begin to say, I love God, but I just don't love the church. The church is discouraging. But we need to distinguish between the imperfect church on earth and God's intention for the church and have a vision for the church that extends beyond her current imperfections. You, you can't love God's glory and decide that you know more than God about the instrument for displaying his glory. Ephesians 10 cannot be removed from the scriptures. The church is not the point. But it makes a point. We need a high view of the church because the church demonstrates, it, it, it's a physical demonstration. It's interesting in this passage, God doesn't just tell the angels directly how wise he is. Isn't that interesting how God chose to do that? But sometimes I, I think we might wish that he had. Well, can you just tell them what your plan was? Just tell them. I mean, they're right there. Just boom it out. I'm going to save people from every tribe and nation. But in God's mind, it's better to show them. God doesn't just tell them. He shows them. It's not just a plan without a demonstration. God has a plan and a demonstration. So he demonstrates that to them. He says, look at this. Watch this. I'm going to do it and see there it's done. And so the church 
both the global church and each local expression is 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 God's demonstration. You, you might might think of I, I thought of this week of science fairs where a child has a thesis and then they want to come and say this equals this when it's attached to this. That's my thesis. Well, that's 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 wonderful, sweetie. But how, how do you know that? Well, just watch this. And then they push this button, and here comes the fan, and it blows and bubbles, and right. And a demonstration proves what you say. That's what God says the church is. The church is God's demonstration of his wisdom to a watching angelic world. The church is God's demonstration of his wisdom to a watching angelic world. This church is God's demonstration of the wisdom of his gospel plan to a watching angelic world. It gives great meaning, bigger than me, meaning to the local church. It doesn't exalt it to the primary place, but it does give incredible meaning to it. What's happening? What's actually, what's the big picture thing that's happening when those guys come in to church early and set up these curtains and the chairs and, and everything else? What's, what's really happening? Now, they're working, and they're getting less sleep, and they're serving the rest of us. And, and, but, but what's really going on? What's really happening? God is proving his wisdom to the angelic world. What's happening when Rob works on song choices? God is demonstrating his wisdom to the watching world. What, what's happening when the church just does what it does, loving one another and serving each other in their move? I, I don't think there's any, there's any unique um, act of the church that's being referenced here. It's just the church in its normal function as the church, by its very nature, in its very existence, as it speaks the truth and love to one another, as it represents the gospel, as it lives, and especially in this passage, in unity with one another, it is God standing back and smiling and saying, look at that. People from diverse backgrounds, people that got saved radically in high school, kids that grew up in church families, people that got saved later in life, early in life, from a drug culture, from a, from a consumed by money culture, people that were consumed with their appearance, people that were consumed with relationships, people that were consumed with, with sex and money and drugs. What happened? All those people, they were brought together into one body in Christ. And what's God doing in that unity that worships him? God's saying, look at that. Do you want to see my wisdom? There it is on display. The gospel that I came up with can create that. If God is willing to use the church as the demonstration of his gospel wisdom, we must not let any temporary discouragement with the church draw us away from playing our part in it. The instrument is the church. Paul just keeps expanding how important this big picture is. He says, look, this, this also isn't just a last-minute plan. This is an eternal fulfillment. Look down there what he says. The goal is the manifold wisdom of God on display. The instrument is the church. And just in case you're tempted to think this was a last-minute, spontaneous change of plans, no, this, this goal was always God's intention. This, verse 11, was according, that's in keeping with the standard of his eternal purpose that he has realized, that means accomplished, in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love that word, according to. Paul used it all the time. It means there was a standard and this measured up to it. The eternal standard of God's plan was that the gospel preaching would create gospel communities to display God's gospel wisdom. That was God's eternal, permanent plan. The church was not an afterthought. It was not a mistake. It was not an interruption. This is one of the reasons why we preach the Old Testament scriptures the way we do in this church. We would say it was always God's plan to bring together people from every tribe and nation in Christ in the church. It was always God's plan. 
We, we don't think that the Old Testament was one uh, dispensation of God's grace that God had to give up on and then change the plan for the church. We think that was always the plan. God led the history forward until it culminated in his expression of his wisdom, the gospel preaching producing gospel communities that reveal his wisdom to the angelic world. And this was always the purpose, it says. Always. This was according to, in keeping with, the eternal purpose that he has realized, that word I think means accomplished, in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's wonderfully comforting that he says realized there. That means this goal, though it is still being applied or seen or consummated on the earth, is as surely accomplished as if we could speak of it in the past tense. Realized, he says. His purpose has been realized. you got to remember, this book's written 30 years or so after Jesus died. So it's pointing back to the life, death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus and saying, Jesus accomplished it. Jesus fulfilled this goal. The goal is fulfilled, accomplished, realized. So we're living out something that has already been achieved. That's the nature of the church. We're living out something that's already been achieved. Don't lose sight of the goal, Paul says, because you might think that we're striving towards a goal that is uncertain. Paul says, no. Jesus, in his death and resurrection, permanently achieved, made definitive, made unchangeable the accomplishment of God's eternal purpose. The goal has been accomplished, and now it's being displayed in the world. Remarkable, remarkable truth here. It points us to something bigger than ourselves. You and I, we are not the point, but we are a part of the point that God is making about himself. Don't lose sight of the goal, Paul says. Cosmic proof of the wisdom of God. Fulfillment of God's eternal plan in Christ Jesus. And unless we would, at this point, be tempted to think of ourselves as a forgotten part, Paul reminds the Ephesians again of the personal benefit of this goal. Christ Jesus our Lord, wow, that's a big plan, Paul. I mean, angels and rulers, eternal purposes realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, the Messiah, the Sovereign. We should be feeling small at this point. We should be feeling insignificant, not significant at all. Eternal purposes? I, I haven't even been around 40 years. This is eternal purposes. I can't go back to the last century. Eternal purposes, it says? Eternal? We should be feeling very small. But then Paul communicates. Don't equate smallness with indifference or insignificance. Look what he says. In whom this one who accomplished God's eternal purpose for the display of his wisdom to the cosmic world, this one, this very one, guess what he means to you? Guess what he means to you? This one who has accomplished this divine purpose, guess what he means to you? Guess what? Guess what he means? He means this. We have in him, we have this possession. We have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Now, Paul, Paul uses three words to make this point as accentuated as he can. Boldness, access, with confidence. The, the, the point is, you're not the point, but you have been given an incredible gift. The one who is revealing his wisdom to the cosmic, divine, angelic, audience is being is being shown God's wisdom that this one who realized God's eternal plan guess what part you have in him you have been given access and confidence boldness to the very throne room of God himself 
That's where you are. So you could have a, a Christian that needs the warning we talked about in that, that passage by David Brooks that, that you think of yourself uh, too highly. I often think of myself too highly. It's, it's about me. I need a grander vision. But it's also possible that Christians think of themselves as, as insignificant, irrelevant in the purposes of God. God is this great, grand, uh, grand uh, majestic, powerful being. What, what, what part do I have? Where, where am I in all of this? You. You, Christian, in Christ, have been given boldness and access with confidence. Boldness and access with confidence. You are not the point, but you have been given incredible access into the very center place of all of this cosmic activity. You're not the point, but you're not on the fringe. You're not the point, but you should not be timid in approaching the one who is the point. You're not the point, but you're not irrelevant. You're not dismissed. You're not outside. You're inside. You're not the point, but you don't have to ask permission to approach the one who is the point. This is where the connection is made. Look, it's much bigger than you, but it relates to you because you have access and boldness with confidence. In other words, you can ask God anything. You can speak anything to God. You can draw near to God without fear or without any hindrance. You can approach him directly. So if, if you need to, let's consider the grandeur of God. And I think many Christians, in America anyway, need that reminder. You are not the point, but we also want to be careful that we don't swing to the other side and think it's irrelevant what happens to me. No, you, you have boldness and access with confidence to the one who is the point. Keep. Keep your eyes on the goal the gospel mission. Don't lose sight of it. Don't lose sight of it. And also, point number two, don't lose heart at the suffering. Don't lose heart at the suffering. Paul essentially brings one primary direct exhortation in the midst of this description of what God is doing. And it's such a brilliant pastoral exhortation. He brings at the end. He, he shows them the vision of what God is about, displaying his wisdom. And you're included in this because you have access and confidence and boldness. Your sins are no longer a barrier between you and God. You can approach him with confidence in the gospel. God is doing something in the world that's beyond your imagination. It gives meaning to your existence and your purpose. You're a part of something more glorious than you could ever imagine. And in light of all of that, I have an exhortation for you, he says. Something I want you to do in light of all that I've just said. So, so, another one of those words that points backwards. So, could translate that, therefore, in light of what God is doing and the incredible part that you play in it, in light of all this, one encouragement, one exhortation, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart over what I am suffering for you. Because it is your glory. Don't lose sight of the goal. Don't lose heart at the suffering. And they relate together, don't they? Keeping the goal in view is what motivates us and helps us not to lose heart at the suffering. It is understandable why the Ephesians, coming as they did from a pagan background, idol worshipers all around them, assuming that gods that are real gods have the power to keep their people in physical well-being. And so they would have assumed, look, if Paul's suffering, it calls into question the ability of God, the power of God, the right of God, maybe maybe this isn't worth it. Perhaps they would have been discouraged or even embarrassed by Paul's suffering. Maybe they would have been thinking, well, if Paul's suffering, how can we know whether this grand plan is actually being accomplished? Because human beings tend to look on suffering as calling into question the power and goodness of God. It's a very natural reaction. 
Human beings tend to look on suffering as calling into question the power and goodness of God. The Ephesians are no exception. Paul is in prison in Rome. Good chance that he's going to be martyred. He's caged by the most powerful human on earth at that time with legions of soldiers and nations bowing before him. No wonder they might lose heart. Is this grand cosmic scheme quite so grand? This preacher that came to our town and told us about Jesus as the Lord of all, told us to give our lives to him. We have boldness and access, he says, but is it quite so grand? So Paul describes the scope. He says, this is what is happening in the spiritual realm. So don't lose heart at temporary suffering. Don't lose heart. He says he is suffering on their behalf. I, th I think what that means is that the, the preaching of the gospel, which would benefit the Ephesians and ultimately us, has always been associated with suffering in the fallen world. It's part of the wisdom of the cross. That the cross and the message that springs from it is not clear to the wisdom of this world. Isaiah says that the servant of the Lord Jesus did not cry aloud or raise his voice in the streets. He says in Isaiah 53, he was not discernible as an impressive person. Who believed what they heard from us, Isaiah says? Who considered? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is nobody. Nobody thought this carpenter from Nazareth was anything impressive. And nobody thought that a criminal who died on a cross could possibly be anything other than a criminal forgotten by history. And nobody would think that a gospel preached by a man in prison in Rome, helpless, could possibly be attached to anything grand enough to captivate our faith. And so they lose heart. Paul says there is more happening than you can see. Don't lose heart at the suffering associated with the gospel ministry. It is that very ministry through suffering that has ushered in this incredible mystery that includes you as a part of God's cosmic plan. Don't be disheartened by the suffering associated with God displaying his glory. Don't lose heart at the suffering. It is your glory because it it is the means by which you are brought into this glorious cosmic plan. Don't lose heart at the suffering. And that is a word that our church and our generation needs today. I do not believe that the church of the next generation will experience the lack of suffering that the church of the last generation in this country received. I think it is highly unlikely, God might surprise me, I pray he does, but highly unlikely that the kind of commendation and accommodation of the Christian message of the last century in this country will be paralleled in the next century. I pray it is, I pray it even grows, but I don't think it is. If there's anything to cultural discernment, I don't think it is. I think it's more likely that there's going to be suffering associated with gospel proclamation. Now, obviously, Paul is unique. No preacher should compare themselves to Paul, but I think we can learn something from this lesson. He's saying, look, look, don't lose heart when the gospel ministry faces persecution. It is through that ministry that the glory of this incredible inheritance has come to the world and even included you. Don't lose heart over the thing that is your glory. Don't lose heart over it. And so I think this is a, an appropriate application for this digression of glory to our generation as well. You are going to see preachers suffering for the sake of the gospel. And if you're under 30, I think you especially are going to see preachers suffering for the proclamation of the gospel. It may not be explicit, but even with Paul, it wasn't explicit. They found other ways to cause proclamation of the gospel to suffer. 
They trumped up a false charge that he had brought Trophimus, the Ephesian, into the temple. And they said, you can't do that. You're undermining our religion. Put him in chains. Send him away. They found ways. They found ways of causing the proclamation of the gospel to suffer. Why? Well, because the evil part of that satanic realm, angelic realm, does not want God's wisdom to be displayed. What they cannot count on is the very thing that they attempt to do to undermine and persecute the gospel in the book of Acts only proves to further the gospel going forward because God's wisdom is not the wisdom of this age where when you crush it, it goes away. The gospel proclamation, when you crush it, it springs up. The more you do against it, the more it prospers. And so I think what Paul would say is, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart over what I'm suffering for you. It is your glory. Christians who believe in the cross should certainly know that a moment of weakness can lead to a moment of incredible strength. So when this happens, and you see gospel proclamation suffering, either an individual Christian or in a preacher like Paul, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. It is your glory. It is the glory of a gospel that has included people from every tribe and nation. Don't lose heart. Don't assume that the gospel can only succeed when the culture applauds it. Don't assume that. Don't assume that the gospel can only succeed when it is politically applauded. Don't assume that. Don't assume that the gospel can only be glorious when the culture accepts it and sees it as legitimate. Don't assume that. No, Paul says. Don't lose heart over what I am suffering for you. Why? Not because I'm not actually suffering. But because this kind of gospel is so wise and so eternal that suffering somehow only furthers the gospel that is our glory. Don't lose heart. Richard Wormbrand was a Romanian pastor. You may have heard of him. He wrote a book called Tortured for Christ, a number of other books. As one account goes, he began a mystery to his ministry to his Romanian countrymen and to Red Army soldiers. When the government attempted to control churches, he immediately began an underground ministry to his people. Richard is remembered for his courage in standing up in a gathering of church leaders and denouncing government control of the churches. He was arrested on February 29th while on his way to church services. He was released after eight years. He was warned not to preach. He resumed his work in the underground church. He was arrested again in 1959, sentenced to 25 years. And during his imprisonment, he was beaten and tortured. Psychological torture included incessant broadcasting of phrases denouncing Christianity. His body bore the scars of physical torture for the rest of his life. He said this about one of his imprisonments. It was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners. It was understood that whoever was caught doing this received a severe beating. A number of us decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching. So we accepted their terms. It was a deal. We preached and they beat us. We were happy preaching. They were happy beating us. So everyone was happy. We decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching. I understand Paul's 
heart when I read passages like that. Don't, don't lose heart. In light of what God is doing through the gospel ministry and the creation of his unstoppable church, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart when you see political voices undermining cultural view of Christianity. Don't lose heart if you anticipate suffering in the next generation. Don't lose heart if you think it's possible that preachers could be imprisoned, persecuted, maligned, and slandered. Don't lose heart. Because when you read that passage, what does it do to you? It reminds you how glorious must this gospel be that makes a person happy to accept that deal, happy to accept it, so that more people can hear the good news of Jesus Christ, so that more people can be added to the community of the gospel. Happy, happy to see themselves be suffering for the sake of the glory of God's cosmic demonstration. Happy, because this life is short, and that demonstration is eternal and will be seen by angels throughout history when that crowd gathers around the throne from every tribe and nation, happy to accept temporary suffering for the sake of the eternal glory of God's church put on display, happy because we receive that glory now as a part of that gospel ministry, happy! Happy to accept a deal that trades the temporary for the divine. Don't lose heart. Why? And how? Keep the glory of the gospel purpose in view. This is the connection between these points. If we think of the gospel as primarily or exclusively about our benefit, when we see or experience suffering, we will wonder whether it's worth it. If it's about our benefit, is it worth it to suffer or to see suffering for the sake of the gospel? But if we keep the cosmic declaration of God's wisdom to the angelic world in view and our incredible part in it of having boldness and access with confidence before him, then, then, when suffering comes to us or to those we know and love, we will say it is our glory because through that preaching, the gospel has come to the Gentiles. Don't lose sight and you won't lose heart. Keep the purpose, the cosmic purpose of the gospel in view. Let's pray. Let's take a minute and just wait in the presence of the Lord. What I'd like us to do is just confess personally to him the privilege that we have in being a part of what he is doing. You can express that by just a quiet prayer. You can express that by kneeling if you want to. Lifting your hands to him. Just some way of declaring it is our glory to be a part, such a privileged part of this purpose.
do something for a moment if um, you could just continue to pray and your heads bow. But if, if there are any of you that resonate with losing heart over cultural changes, the, the slander, or accusation, even persecution of Christianity, maybe there's just been a, a measure of fear in the last few years, and as you think about the future, maybe as you think about your children, if you have children, the next generation, if, if that's true of you in some regard, I would like you to, if you would be willing, uh, just to identify that temptation in your heart that you've, you've just battled with, the temptation to lose heart, just by raising your hand, just identifying that to the Lord. take your hands down. I, I, I just think it's there's something meaningful about declaring, Lord, I'm tempted to lose heart. And I'd like to pray for you. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters that I can relate to, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would right now bring the comfort of your Holy Spirit to them. Lord, the grandeur, the certainty of your work and your unstoppable church. Lord, the temporary suffering that one generation to the next will experience, Lord, may it not frighten them. But your word says, fear not, for I am with you. When you pass through the waters, they will not overwhelm you. And through the fire, you will not be burned. But we know that you sustain and build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Suffering that we do experience is temporary. It's temporary, Lord. It reveals the genuineness of our faith. So I pray you would, you would replace any fear, any temptation to fear with boldness and courage and confidence and assurance. Lord, would you do that right now by your Holy Spirit? Lord, through the power of your Spirit, Lord, would you replace where there has been uh, temptations and, and even uh, acquiescing to uh, fear. Lord, replace that with a courage, with a confidence with an assurance, a peaceful assurance of your power and your purpose on this earth. We pray for that, Lord. We pray for the revival of your church. We pray that your church would be bold. We pray for preachers who will preach boldly, unashamedly about your truth, who will gladly accept any kind of suffering for the privilege of proclaiming your truth. Lord, I, I pray that this church would be a means of, of raising up new preachers who will proclaim and declare and witness to your gospel unashamedly, Lord. I pray for every Christian to be an ambassador of your truth at the, regardless of the cost. Lord, we pray that you would replace our fear with faith. That we would not lose heart. We would not lose sight of your glory being put on display through your church. Thank you, Lord, for including us in this plan in such a privileged way, boldness and access with confidence before you. Why we would have such a place of honor, Lord, is only owing to your grace. Keep our eyes up, Lord. Keep our hearts filled with faith. Glorify yourself. In Jesus' name we pray.